Good morning, everyone, on this absolutely gorgeous 28 August 2022. As you can see, the light is shining on the church today. It looks absolutely beautiful. And it would look even more beautiful if the church were full of parishioners. And we're starting to get there, folks. Pastor Katie Daly's sermon today is called Building Character. Thank you for tuning in, and see you in church. Good morning. As we gather today, let us start with a prayer to just kind of get us into the mood for worship. Let us renew life. Whenever hands intertwine whenever bread is broken and broken again wherever life is celebrated by an embrace by an attentive look your love O oh god is like the perfume of spring the air of september that announces the awakening of life coloring our dreams and our hopes let's renew life throw away the old you Let's paint with new colors such that we can be your collaborators in this space where we build and reconstruct our lives. And as we gather today, for those of you who are in line, you know, it's very important to have a prayer community that you gather with in person because after all, that's what Jesus said. Gather together. Pray, break bread, and share not on your own all the time. So even if you can't join us here at this church, you're not close to Richmond, I encourage you to have a prayer community, a support community, where you will go and worship in person. And here we are, a community that is a come as you are church. Everybody is welcome, no matter where your faith journey has taken you. And we believe God is still speaking. God's voice didn't just end with the canon of the scriptures. When we sit in the presence of God and we feel the presence, God is still speaking to us. So we are glad you were with us, and I'm truly glad that our people are here in person because it makes such a big difference that we pray together. And now for the ringing of our bell and the lighting of the candle. We light this candle to remember that Jesus is the light of the world and we are to be Christ's light in the world for all of those that we encounter. Now I invite Christ to come up for our music moment. Well, we're going to sing what would be called a contemporary hymn in just a few minutes, moments. And I thought I'd give you some background to it. Uh, and I'm going to quote from the gentleman that wrote it here. This is all in his words. This is how this song came about. In 1984, I was a school teacher in Seattle. And since I had the summer off, I decided to go back to Bible college. But only for the summer term. I headed for Dallas, Texas, and... Christ for the Nations Institute. Little did I know I was about to, what was about to happen to me, especially with all that I would be exposed to and the worship emphasis of the school. He said he had, I had a roommate at the CFNI who was a very vibrant Christian. He challenged me to go on a fast, a period of time when a person refrains from eating solid foods in order to give time to the readings of the Bible and to prayer. I took up a challenge. And on the 19th day of the fast, I found myself sitting at a piano trying to write a song. I was simply playing chord progressions when I noticed a Bible on the music stand of the piano. It was open to Psalm 42. My eyes fell on the first verse of that chapter. 
as the hart or deer panted after the water, brooks, let me say that again, as the deer panted after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. After reading the verse, I began to sing its message right off the page. I wrote the first verse and the chorus of the song pretty much straight through. The whole adventure was completed in a matter of minutes and then repeated the song I had just written. I wanted to seal it in my mind. Well, I won't go through the lyrics here. We're going to do that ourselves when we sing it. But here's what happened. He said, I had no intention of the showing the song to anyone. It was to be for my own devotional time with the Lord. However, before leaving the school to go back to Seattle, I did share it with one person. Slow down. <laughs> Slow down. Well, I have one minute, right? So no, no, I don't know. Slow down so we can hear you. Okay. Well, I'll slow it down. Please. So he introduced it uh, to one of his student friends. Since that introduction of the song, it has been translated into several languages and is often sung in other countries. Orchestras have used it. It has been sung in unusually different styles. So, this gentleman who wrote the song has traveled extensively, teaching in worship conferences. In Korea, in the 1990s, he attended one such conference, and when he walked into the stadium, 100,000 Koreans were singing his song as the deer. So there's your music. Ten minutes. <laughs> Now for a call to worship. God, we come to you in this gathering of community where there are no barriers and all our abilities are celebrated as gifts. We come to receive your hospitality of caring for each one of us and to learn from you how to offer such a celebration to stranger friend, chosen family, those whose faces are unfamiliar to us and the face who meets us in the mirror. Amen. Please stand for our August song.
our call to confession, whether we think we need it or not. God, sometimes we say, I'm too busy to your invitations to kindness, friendship, or activism, or we pretend to be too busy and avoid being indebted, pitied, or rubbing elbows with those who make us uncomfortable. Sometimes we accept an invitation to be involved, celebrate with someone, or just have coffee, but back out sometimes to a no-show. Together. God, sometimes we are imperfect guests, wanting to be the center of attention, and other times we insist on always being host, giver, one in control, receiver of praise and gratefulness. Together. Forgive us when we fail in gratitude or generosity. Amen. Assurance of pardon. God loves, invites, nudges, embraces us in all our resistance to simply hold a balloon of joy and clap at the candles of another's cake. We are forgiven. A plate is set for us. God's redemptive love, redemption is free to receive. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now for our prayer for illumination. Together. Eternal God, your word speaks truth into our lives. When we humble ourselves to listen, you mature us with knowledge and strength and faith. Open us to your word. Read and proclaim the day, so we might hear and embrace the message you have sent to us. Amen. Now I invite Christine to come forward for our readings. <laughs> first reading is a reading from the book of Sirach, chapter 10, verses 12 through 18. The beginning of human pride is to forsake the Lord. The heart has withdrawn from its maker. For the beginning of pride is sin, and the one who clings to it pours out abominations. Therefore, the Lord brings upon them unheard of calamities and destroys them completely. The Lord overthrows the thrones of rulers and enthrones the lowly in their place. The Lord plucks up the roots of the nations and plants the humble in their place. The Lord lays waste the lands of the nations and destroys them to the foundations of the earth. He removes some of them and destroys them and erases the memory of them from the earth. Pride was not created for human beings or violent anger for those born of women. The word of God for the people of God. The second reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses one through eight, 15 and 16. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured, as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled, for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. 
For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise, to praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And I know we are in ordinary time and the color is green, but I've been wearing the blue with the yellow because of Ukraine and the war that's been going on already for six months. So our gospel reading is from Luke, chapter 14, verse 1 and then 7 to 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited you may come to you and say, I give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said, to the one who had invited him. When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as always, I always have trouble putting my sermon title together. So I'm going to begin with something you guys have heard before. And you may remember it from, I finished my graduate school program and we were given 20 minutes to come up with something in no more than a couple minutes of what we learned over the last three years. And I came up with what I call my five finger philosophy. So those of you online, don't be offended. So thumbs up to what is good and positive. Next, number one is God. God is first. Next, you flip off fear. And next, 
You march forth with integrity in everything that you do. And lastly, but most important, is that you pay attention to the little things in life because that is what's going to actually give you the most joy. So you got it? Thumbs up to what's good and positive. Remember, God is number one. Flip off fear, march forth with integrity, and pay attention to the little things that absolutely will give you the most joy. I wish our elected officials, especially, knew about marching forth with integrity. That's the closest I'll get to saying anything political. So, there was a time when Aesop wrote a whole bunch of little stories, and lots of us are familiar with the stories that Aesop wrote. And there was one time a frog who sat on his little muddy little home, and he sat there day by day, and he'd watch the birds fly overhead. He was like, man, I wonder what that's like up there. And then all of a sudden, a stork came on down and sat right next to him. He's sitting there and he's like, wow, I wonder what it's like to be. So he starts talking to the stork. What's it like to be up there and to see everything? He said, it's really nice. But the stork, quite frankly, didn't want to be bothered, but he was interrupting with the conversation because the minnows and the fish were all getting out of the way and he couldn't get what he came for his lunch. So he was kind of trained to ignore the frog. And the frog is there I say to him, I want to go for a ride up in the air. So finally he comes up with an idea. He says, well, Mr. Stork, I, I think I have, I have an idea. How about, how about if I tell you where all my little friends are, and I show you where you can find them for your dinner, in exchange that you take me for a soaring ride up into the air? Stork says, done deal. And sure enough, after he had ate his fill, the frog's ready to go, and he says, ooh, how are we going to do this? So the frog came up with the idea of, ooh, I'm just going to bite on your foot. Hang on like that, and off we can go. And so off they went, and as they went up, they went up oh, higher and higher and higher, and the frog was paying attention and looking down below, and all of a sudden, there were humans down below looking up at the strange sight. They were like, look at that. Did you ever see anything like that? A stork flying with a frog hanging on to his foot? I wonder if it was the stork's idea or the frog's idea. And the frog, being pushed up with pride, said, it was me. And off he went. He fell right on down. Pride goeth before the fall. Aesop's fables. We can go all the way back and there are lessons to be learned from the old time writers and the newest writers and even the scripture writers. Yes, pride goeth before the fall. And Aesop was not the first to teach this profound truth. It was also in the wisdom literature of Judaism in the writers of Sirach that we heard today, and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, they taught the same thing. Pride is the first and the trickiest of sins. For it really attacks us at a point of victory. It hides in the applause of others for our good deeds. Pride is the shadow lurking on the backside of success. It is no harmless sin, for pride is cancer of the soul. It's the ruin of character, the destroyer of healthy relationships, all of those. Pride gets in the way. Pride accepts no criticism and reduces everybody else to subordinates under them. They're higher than everybody else. And ultimately, it demands to almost
almost be equal to God. So no wonder the early church fathers called pride one of the seven deadly sins. We don't like that word sin, do we? Especially in today's society. Nobody sins. We all do everything all right. But Jesus had something to say about this subject as well. And in that gospel lesson today, he used the normal patterns of social life to illustrate how important it is to develop an honest humility to counteract those erosive effects of pride. While at the guest, as a guest of the religious leader, he was there with one of the prominent people. It's noticed that everyone else is really paying close attention to Jesus as he is there. It is the Sabbath, and they're wondering, what's he going to do here? It's almost like somebody is there as a plant to see if Jesus is going to respond to their need. And so they're watching him very carefully. And Jesus doesn't care about tradition and some rules when it gets in the way of people who need to be healed. And Jesus is watching how everybody's kind of positioning themselves around the table. Who's more important? I should sit there. Who's going to be next to the host? And he's basically trying to tell people, you know what? Don't pay attention to that. Sometimes we need to detach ourselves from all this me, 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 self-importance. As Jesus is watching them vie for the most important seats, he's telling them, don't go there. Wait until you're asked to come a little bit more forward. And so many times we fall into that category of trying to impress. I always refer to it as impress, impression management. And sometimes we forget that when we're in other locations other than when we know we're being watched, we're being watched a little bit more carefully. You know, when we talked about the lady in the car who got so angry at the driver in front of her, who made it so she had to stop at the red light, she had a whole bunch of signs on her car about how good she was, but her actions spoke a lot louder than the words. Remember the police officer came, made sure she got in jail, all of that that went on, because he was convinced that that car had been stolen. So Jesus is saying that if you can get away from impression management in all aspects of life, and really be true in all that you do, all of the time, that's what people see. And that's the kind of person Jesus is looking for at that party. We've always been asked to be transformed. Be ye transformed. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Be ye transformed. But we fight it tooth and nail because we don't want to change in any way, shape, or form. We, we would rather just play this game of let's impress everybody about who I am and how special I am. It's that self-posturing that we do, whether it's for a promotion or the limelight or just one-upmanship in life. If we get too much into the habit of always doing that, that's when we're going to fall. We're going to be just like the frog who had to open his mouth and say, it was me. So instead of trying to work everything to our advantage, sometimes we have to just drop out of that game. You know, that game that says, somebody else is going to take my place. And if they do, so what? Because we all know, if we drop dead today, 
Someone's going to be here in 24 hours to take our place. So does it matter if you gain the whole world with all of those manipulation techniques and you lose your own soul? Or you lose all the real, the real relationships along the way? What have you won? You know, in life, we probably all have three or four real friends who will actually look at us and say, hey, you know what, Katie, you're off the wall on that. And we all know that we don't pay attention to everybody and what everybody has to say. We know who those close people are who will always be honest with us. And those are the ones we need to go to on a regular basis. The ones who are honest, who can say, you really screwed up here. Did you hear what you had to say? Think of who they are in your life right now. Give thanks to God for those people. Those people who are true, who are honest with you. Because they're so important in our life. You know, Jesus wants us to set a new pattern in motion in the world. You know, a pattern of honesty and humility. You know, where competitors can be converted into companions. You know, so we could work together. Where people shed their masks and accept the glorious truth that we are all basically at the same level with each other. We are all children of God. We are all supposed to love all the children of God, not just those who think like us. Oh, there's something good in every single person. You know, and if we could do that, the need for that social climbing ladder wouldn't be so important. What we would do is recognize the importance of a table where we come together in humility and in all of our sinfulness, because all of us are sinners looking to God to save us. That's where the power is. No more power grabs. Just be who you are, loved as a child of God. And with Jesus, in that reading, he says, invite the poor, and the crippled, and the maimed, and the blind. He's saying, invite the people that don't just look like you, act like you, or have your same income status. He says, recognize that every single one is a child of God. And I know it seems unrealistic sometimes. And Jesus going into that whole thing on table manners today, I don't really think he cared about the spoons and the forks and everything being in the right place. He was basically saying, in those little things, that's where we notice character development. I think that's why when you go for an interview, sometimes they take you out for a round of golf, or they take you to dinner, because they're watching those little things. They're paying attention not only to what your what your your letter of recommendation said, they're paying attention to who you really are in another setting. You know, are you some are you someone who kind of kicks the ball a little bit? Are you someone who walks into a restaurant and just ignores the person who happens to be sitting outside who might be without anything to eat? And you kind of look down on them? Those are the kind of things, those little things, that are paid attention to when you go for a job interview. It's not your GPA. That matters. But you know how nice it is when you go to a school that basically fail or pass. Nothing in between. We as Americans are so used to having everybody on that ladder. we got to be at the top of the ladder. And when you go for a job interview, what matters is that you got your degree. And your people skills is what's going to matter the most. People skills. 
And in Jesus, in the story, he's not just talking about those things at the table. He's saying, what are your manners? Where's your integrity? You know, we all do things at the table. Everybody's kitchen table is probably the most important place in their entire house. Because that's where you come and you might pray before your meal, but that's where you share the stories of your day. That's where you share your life. It's at the table where you break bread and you invite people to your table. And when you do, the conversation is around everybody because everybody's opinion, everybody's sharing is equally important. Table fellowship. You know, for anybody who has their kitchen table or dining room table where everything happened, that's probably the one thing in your, fa in your family stuff that one of your kids may want because that was the place where all of the stories were shared, the memories. So table fellowship is what God is talking about, the importance of every single one. And the table is a holy place. It is a holy place where everything begins to take place. Come in and you say, I got cut from the team. Or you come in and say, I made it first. It's nice to be first, but you share it at the table at a common meal. And in God's table, it's just like our family table at home. There's no posturing. There's no, oh, we've got to be this, 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 or this in order to come to my table. Remember I said my table, it's not, it's God's table. Not any denomination's table. And we come to the table because every single one of us, every one of us is in need of forgiveness and grace. And it comes because of God's provision. God will provide. At God's table, there is no competition. There's room enough for every one of us. And it's not a place to come with a clenched fist or teeth. You come with an open heart that says, Hey God, I'm here. What do you need me to do? And how do you need me to change? So you approach table, knowing that forgiveness is always available, only we accept it, and when we break bread together, we are following the words of Jesus when he said, you gather in my name and you remember, gather in my name, gather, gather, not just sit at home because it's convenient, be disciplined enough yeah, with the people. Everybody should have that kind of faith community where they can gather with somebody who's going to be there who will tell them the truth. Sometimes we don't like it. But someone there at the table will tell you who you really are. And it's important to have that kind of faith community. Faith communities always invite did you find the one that suits your fancy, the one where you feel a little connection to the people, and then you feel enough of a connection that you want to be with them on a regular basis? It's one thing to go online and watch at a convenient time, but it's quite another thing to be disciplined enough to make it a point to come in person, in person, with the people that you've been with for a lot of years. It's not about convenience, it's not about the time, it's about discipline, discipleship. Disciple means discipline and learner. That's all God is asking, that we be a disciple who learns and somebody who's open to being discipled, taught by somebody else. I do my best here. You leave here and you talk to other people. 
And those other people talk to somebody else. And just very quickly, I want to share with you that one of the other UCC churches in Chicago, I watched it just recently, and it happens to be a preacher that I really admire. And they were doing, they were doing baby dedication. Dedication. And I was surprised, because it's the United Church of Christ that baptizes babies. But this particular church chooses to postpone baptism until a time that the kids are older can say, yeah, I kind of understand this stuff. I'm willing to do this. So I leave here, and I try to catch somebody else to disciple me, because I need to learn from other people. And that's the same thing with all of us. We come to hear, to share, and pass the word along, because at the baptism, when you were baptized, and maybe when you were a godparent for somebody else, it was mentioned, but maybe not strong enough. If you are a godparent to somebody, you have the responsibility, if those parents are not making sure that the child is growing up knowing Jesus, it's your responsibility to see to it that they develop a relationship with Jesus. It's not just a ceremonial thing to be a godparent. It's a big responsibility, especially in today's world. So let us remember that when we come together in fellowship, you know, we come with smiles and open hearts, recognizing that every single one of us is a sinner in need of God's forgiveness and trying to just love everybody for who they are. If we could start doing that, maybe others could do it too. And the people said, Amen. Now as you gather in your mind, the people who are in need of prayer, there are so many. We continue to pray, of course, for Lily, 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 little Lily, who is still in the hospital. But thank you, God, she's now able to swallow. Just a simple thing, like being able to swallow, is her biggest blessing right now. And I pray for Colleen Woodhouse, who's been going through numerous tests. Uh, hopefully they will find out how to treat what's going on within her and for all the people who are having testings of some sort, medical tests, this coming week, we lift them up. Uh, please bow your head as I pray. In Christ's place. God, can we be honest? hard to pray when the world seems in shambles. Our petitions, our thoughts, our prayers aren't enough to wake up people losing everything in wildfire, fires, floods, and war. Monkeypox and polio are on the rise, and we're not yet clear of COVID. Political leaders are on trial, fighting more scandals than fixing problems. What are we to do, God? How are we to be in this world of chaos and confusion? Living God, bolster us, we pray, through word and worship. Remind us we are not alone. Support us with your Spirit's presence, who gives words even to the least eloquent. Help us recall how you have equipped saints and ancestors who did not know how to respond. 
mold us into the kind of people who can help you bend the arc of this universe towards justice. We do pray for those impacted by polio that has returned within our country. We pray for accountability if you are a gun owner. Never should a five-year-old be killed because someone was not being responsible. We pray for that five-year-old who accidentally shot and killed himself thinking what he picked up was a toy. How many times did this happen? Finally, here are petitions for those in special need of grace today. For victims of violence and abuse. For the hungry and unhoused. For the neglected and lonely. For the misunderstood and marginalized. For the ill, the dying, and those responsible for their care. We praise you, God of glory, for your attention and your presence with us in prayer. We thank you for being in relationship with us. Hear us now as we collectively dare to pray the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, The invitation to generosity stands every week for anyone who wants to participate. We are invited to offer our resources, our time, our abilities, our compassion on days when our lives are full and days when we feel empty. We are invited to offer what we have and accept what we need. Our practice, one of them is for the Good Samaritan Fund and for the special collections that we have during the year that are offered through and by our conference. Let us give a profound yes to the invitation of God. Our gifts come in many ways. Here in the back, in the mailbox. Thank you. A prayer of dedication. God, we bring these gifts, our response to your invitation. In this giving, we find ourselves not listening, but being joyful, truly humble, and deeply fed by your grace. Receive these tokens of our gratitude, God, and bless them. May these gifts in return, provide for others in ways that gives glory to you. God calls, Christ saves, and the Spirit sends us into mission and ministry. May you be blessed when you sit at fine tables of welcome and when you spread the picnic basket of peace. May you be blessed in giving and receiving, not repaid, but your hearts repaired. Repair, repair. Please stand. <laughs>
couple cookies in the back. Enjoy your week. Good.